Like when I, I connect dots that maybe shouldn't be connected, I don't know. But certain dots, like when I see that they put every black man in the movies in a dress at some point in their career, I'll be connecting that dot. Like, why all these brothers gotta wear a dress? Listen, Chappelle is one of the most brilliant people I have ever seen in my life, man. And right just, on. Uh, just not just in comedy, but the man is smart, a heavy, right on. brilliant thinker. Isn't it crazy that someone like Tyler Perry, who's supposed to be doing good, is getting accused of messing things up for black entertainers? Dave Chappelle has been talking about it for ages, and now it seems like he's gearing up for more. There are whispers that Chappelle is finally calling out Tyler Perry for supposedly betraying black men. You know how it goes? Stories about Perry being power hungry and ready to do whatever to get his way, even if it means crossing his fellow black entertainers. We're here to spill all the tea, so grab a seat and get ready because this is about to get interesting. So, Dave Chappelle spilled some tea on Oprah's show about the industry. He was talking about how he's a bit of a conspiracy theorist and noticed this weird thing. They put every black man in movies in a dress at some point. Chappelle had this experience while filming a movie with Martin Lawrence. He walks into the trailer and sees a dress, thinking it's the wrong one. Turns out, it's for a scene where Martin's character Character sneaks out of jail by dressing Chappelle as a prostitute. Chappelle's like, nah, I'm not doing that. It wasn't in the discussion. They try to pressure him, saying it's a hilarious bit, but he stands his ground, saying he doesn't need a dress to be funny. The whole thing gets intense with writers, directors, and producers pushing, but Chappelle sticks to his guns. In the end, they come up with a new scene without the dress, and he's left wondering, how did you write that so fast? Dave just didn't vibe with it, not because wearing a dress is an issue on its own, but because he felt the industry was trying to corner black artists into doing whatever it took for success. They kept hounding him until they figured out he wouldn't budge. Dave revealed this whole experience was an eye-opener. It took being told to wear a dress for him to connect the dots and realize this wasn't just his struggle. Lots of other black men had been asked to do the same. Martin Lawrence rocked it in Big Mama's house, Eddie Murphy pulled it off in the Nutty Professor series, and Jamie Foxx left a mark with his unforgettable ugly Wanda on In Living Color. Then you've got the Wyans brothers trying their hand at it with white chicks. Oh, and we can't forget the less successful Juana man. Yeah, some would rather forget that one. In the mix of all this, Tyler Perry takes the cake. He's not just known for his entertainment game, but has major influence, even in right-wing evangelical circles. His Medea franchise? Talk about significant success and acclaim in the entertainment world. Kevin Hart chimed in, saying artists need to protect their brand and not cross certain boundaries. He shared that, up to that point, he hadn't faced any challenges to his personal beliefs. When asked if he ever ran into the whole wearing a dress scenario, Kevin was like, nope, haven't faced that dress dilemma. Gotta have boundaries and limits. He emphasized the importance of knowing you're a brand and protecting it at all times. Kevin mentioned turning down a request to dribble a basketball on a talk show because it would make him look foolish. Protecting the brand, you know? His nine-year-old Oscar nominee, <laughs> Kevenshine. But here's the twist. Just a year later, Kevin ended up on an SNL skit wearing a dress. Fans weren't having it and accused him of being a sellout and fake. So now people are wondering, why did Kevin Hart end up in the hot seat? Well, it seems like it was just his turn to go through the Hollywood rite of passage. See, the whole wearing a dress thing isn't unique to Kevin. It's like a tradition that many male celebs before him have gone through. It's part of a bigger conspiracy, or at least that's what some folks believe. But you gotta understand, that's not my case, right? Uh, I didn't, I didn't, I, nobody owned that dress. Right. But me. That's right. Nobody told me, it's a $2 billion franchise. So, Tyler Perry fired back at Dave Chappelle in an interview saying, look, Chappelle is one of the smartest guys I've ever seen. Not just in comedy, but in deep thinking. If that's how it rolls in Hollywood, cool. But that ain't my story. Nobody told me to wear that dress but me. It's my $2 billion franchise, and it's always been my choice. I've done 19 movies since then, all by my own call. Maybe it's different for others, but for me, it's like putting on a work uniform. I'm not a guy who enjoys wearing a dress, but as an actor, it's a costume. It's like someone going to Walmart, you put on your uniform. For me, it's about putting on that uniform, going out, making people laugh, lifting them up, and giving them some encouragement. Encouragement. That's how I see it. I have an entire new script with all new lines, pages and pages and pages. I have an hour to learn this stuff. Agent was like, absolutely not. If Brandon doesn't feel comfortable with playing this character, then he can walk from this because you don't have to do anything that you don't feel comfortable doing. But hold up, is that the whole story, Tyler? Some straight actors are claiming Perry's pushing them into gay roles, creating job drama. Actor and voice coach Brandon J spilled the tea on TikTok, dishing about the struggles on Perry Meet the Brown set. According to Jay, it's like a week's worth of shooting crammed into a day, with Perry throwing last-minute script changes at actors. 
Jay, who tried out for a role as a bullied high school dude, spills all the details. So, get this. The actor caught on to Tyler Perry not vibing with the original script, and that meant everyone had to scramble to learn new lines on the spot, all chosen by the big boss himself. According to Jay, Perry went full-on impromptu, rewriting the entire script right there and feeding the lines to the actors. And get this, if you didn't catch on quick, Perry would drop the, you're fired bomb, but it doesn't stop there. As Jay hustles to get those new lines down, Perry decides, out of the blue, that Jay's character is going to be gay and crushing on his high school bully. Yep, not what Jay signed up for at his audition. Perry drops the bomb like, I want Jeffrey to be and have a crush on his bully. Crazy, right? In the second part of the saga, Jay spills that his first reaction was to hit up his agent, who basically said, you don't have to take this if you're not cool with it. But after some serious pondering, Jay decided it was a chance he didn't want to miss out on. So, despite Perry throwing in a last-minute twist and making the character gay, Jay went ahead and played the role. All right, let's dive into this whole dress thing in Hollywood and figure out what's the deal. So you start wondering, why do they keep doing this? Why is it always these tough young brothers ending up in dresses? It's a head-scratcher, right? Right? To get to the bottom of it, we gotta go back to the roots. This whole emasculating black men thing has been around since slavery days, and they even had a name for it, buck breaking. Let me break down the origin of buck breaking real quick. Back in the day, mainly in the Caribbean, slave owners used this messed up tactic against male slaves who were seen as rebellious. Picture this. They'd make the enslaved guy drop his pants, bend over a tree stump, and then whip him real bad. The goal? Weaken him so he couldn't resist the R that followed. Yeah, it's heavy stuff. The white slave owner would go ahead and do the unspeakable, right in front of the enslaved man's wife. Imagine the trauma of that. Now, fast forward to today, and you see a similar vibe. Strong black men, even in Hollywood, ending up in dresses, just like they did back then. It messes with your head, especially for kids seeing these role models switching up like that. It's like they're playing mind games, doing it in front of fans, family, the whole deal. That's the connection folks are making. History repeating itself, but in a different form. Crazy, right? It's kind of funny, in a messed up way. You notice the pattern? They always bring in these strong black manly dudes first. Like they weren't dressing up in high school or middle school, always rocking that masculine vibe. And it's not about being gay or whatever. If that's your style, do you? No judgment. But we're talking about straight black men here. Here. Check out how they enter Hollywood, all strong and confident. Then peep how they leave. It's a whole different scene, and you can't just blame the industry alone. These guys make the choice to go along with it. Tyler Perry even said in that interview, replying to Dave Chappelle, that nobody forced him into anything. It's the same deal. They willingly bow down to the agenda just to level up. We gotta hold them accountable too. They're ready to do anything for that next level. Even if it means going through this weird ritual. The industry's like, how bad do you want this money? Are you down to sell out your people? Push a certain agenda? Agenda and emasculate yourself in front of everyone, just like the buck breaking back in the day. But now it's crazy. These dudes are willingly allowing it. Times have changed, and now it's a choice. Um, at the end of the day, Kevin doesn't have to worry about what people are going to say about him wearing a dress because of the long line of dress wearing people before him. We had Big Mama's house one, two, and three. Yeah. I've never seen Medea in a pantsuit. I think she wears dresses. <laughs> so now I'm saying, why are we picking on poor little Kevin Hart? Because it was his turn next. Even Cat Williams had to say in an interview about Kevin Hart rocking a dress on SNL. He's like, look, nothing might be funnier than a guy in a dress, especially a black guy. Cat talks about choices and how Kevin doesn't have to stress because there's this whole history of people rocking dresses in comedy, like Big Mama's house and Medea. But then then Cat drops the Illuminati bomb. He's saying some folks are against it, and it comes at a cost. When you're anti-Illuminati, you get punched in the face by the media, hated, discredited, the whole deal. Cat brings up how they did the same thing to DMX. It's like he's saying there's more to these dress-wearing moments than just comedy. It's like some weird ritual these guys gotta go through. Interestingly, Dave Chappelle also talked about something similar when he appeared on The Oprah Show back in 2006. He let everyone in on the fact that he turned down a massive $50 million deal from Comedy Central. When Oprah asked the the burning question, why give up all that dough? Dave got straight to the point. It wasn't about the money, it was about dodging the drama that comes with it. He explained how hitting that new level messes with your head, needing time to adjust to the whole new vibe. Dave's been in the showbiz game since he was 14, so he's seen the behind-the-scenes drama unfold. When Oprah pressed him about the stories he's heard, he got real about stars 
like Mariah Carey snagging big deals and then suddenly going off the rails. Laurence Olivier too, waving a gun on the street, claiming they're out to get him. It's that weird stuff that happens when they're on the brink of the next big career move. So, Dave Chappelle spilled even more tea, talking about how these big media companies wanted him to write sketches that made people laugh at him, not with him. Basically, they were saying if he didn't humiliate himself, he wouldn't hit the big leagues of rich and famous. At the same time this person was <laughs> harassing me for years, multiple young black men on the payroll and they just had to show up when he was when he requested them to be there all right back to tyler perry his personal life has been a hot topic lately with rumors flying that he might be projecting some suppressed stuff onto black male actors but hold on to your hats because the drama gets juicier now there's talk about tyler possibly taking advantage of younger black men in the industry christian keys stirred the pot even more with a teary instagram video spilling about power abuse in the biz he shared his own rough encounter with a high-powered dude who supposedly bragged about having a bunch of young black men under his wing christian didn't spill the beans on names, but you bet the internet's playing detective. Now here's where it gets wild. Christian has been rolling with Tyler Perry for almost two decades. From Diary of a Mad Black Woman back in 2005 to the recent TV series All the Queen's Men. So naturally, everyone's connecting the dots and wondering if Tyler Perry is the mystery man in Christian's story. All right, let's keep it real here. What we're hearing is all speculation. And only Christian Keys has the real lowdown on who that powerful dude is. He's been dropping hints, saying he's got the receipts and even passed them on to the police. So we might get the 411 on this mystery in a few days or weeks. But hey, regardless of Christian's situation, Tyler Perry's been dealing with other accusations, like giving writers the boot out of the blue, casting characters that play into stereotypes, and pushing some not-so-great narratives about black women. All right, so after killing it at the box office, Tyler Perry made his way to TV with the hit sitcom House of Pain. But when it came to scoring a sweet syndication deal and a spin-off named Meet the Browns, things got messy. According According to Deadline, Perry gave the boot to four writers asking for union contracts, stirring up drama in the industry. It was not a good look. I feel like I was slapped in the face like we were used, writer Terry Brown Jackson told Deadline. We were good enough to create over a hundred episodes, but now when it comes to reaping the benefits of the show being syndicated and having other spin-offs from it, he decides to let us go unless we accept a horrible offer. Kelly Griffin, the head writer for House of Pain, said she wasn't going down without a fight. While I'd like to see something positive come out of this for us, if this fight helps future black writers get what they deserve, that's a good thing. But what was Perry's response? He claimed he's writing everything himself now, but his union issues didn't stop there. In 2015, actor unions SAG-AFTRA and Actors Equity went all in, banning their members from Perry's play Medea on the Run because his production company wouldn't sign those union contracts. Looks like Perry's profit game isn't winning cheers from everyone in the business. So after House of Pain and Meet the Browns hit it big, cultural critic Jamila Lemieux wrote an open letter to Tyler Perry, and NPR published it. Lemieux straight up told Perry she wasn't vibing with how he used stereotypes in his work. She said, Through her, the country has laughed at one of the most important members of the black community, Mother Deer, the beloved matriarch. I just can't quite get with seeing Mother Deer played by a six foot three man with prosthetic breasts flopping in the wind. Our mothers and grandmothers deserve much more than that. Heck, our fathers and grandfathers deserve more. Mr. Perry, you have told the Hollywood old guard to kiss your backside, and I appreciate appreciate that, brother. But many black folks have expressed some of the very same attitudes about your work that white critics have. I still think there a lot of stuff that's on today is coonery buffoonery. And I know it's making a lot of money. And guess who else joined the critique party? None other than film director Spike Lee. He wasn't shy about calling out Perry for those stereotypical characters. According to Spike, the industry could step up its game by ditching those one-dimensional characters in Perry's record-breaking, but, in his words, biased and nonsensical movies. So Tyler Perry's casting choices and how he portrays characters are raising eyebrows, sparking talks about his whole business approach. Some folks are saying Perry tends to stick dark-skinned actors in villain roles while making white characters the heroes in his films. Even Chris Rock chimed in, pointing out a pattern in Perry's movies. Rock noticed there's not a whole lot of kind and respectful black-skinned boyfriends in Perry's films. To drive his point home, he brought up Tupac Shakur, saying Perry's films could use a bit more variety in character representation. He said, Tupac might be a political leader if he was alive, but then again, Tupac might be in a Tyler Perry movie right now, so you don't know. He might be. Tupac might be the bad dark-skinned boyfriend in the Tyler Perry movie. So, so Chris Rock's deal was this. He's saying
saying Tupac, who was a big deal in his rap days, might not score a hero role if he landed a spot in a Tyler Perry flick. Rock figures, based on Perry's usual casting moves, the chances of Tupac getting cast as a hero would be pretty slim. Just Rock sharing his thoughts on how things roll in the Tyler Perry movie universe. He further went on saying, I would hope he's a senator, but he might be kicking Jill Scott down a flight of stairs. So, Chris Rock and Spike Lee are on the same page, pointing out that Tyler Perry's casting and storytelling choices might be playing a part in certain movies' success. Thanks to some biases, they're both questioning how this mindset could be messing with the film industry. And you know what? This colorism thing isn't exactly a stranger to Hollywood. Lately, Hollywood's been under fire with media campaigns and hashtags spreading like wildfire, shining a light on some pretty shady stuff. Remember Harvey Weinstein? Yeah, he was one of the first big shots to drag the industry into the negative spotlight with abuse allegations in 2017. Now, there's even a new documentary spilling the tea on the dark side of Hollywood, exposing power players allegedly preying on aspiring actors. Fast forward to the Hash Me Too movement, and Hollywood's hit with scandals left and right. Kevin Hart stepped down as the Oscars host in 2019 over past homophobic tweets, and the Hash Oscars So White campaign is calling for more diversity and recognition for people of color and marginalized communities. I sincerely hope I shall always be a credit to my race and to the motion picture industry. My heart is too full. So Hollywood's reputation has been significantly tarnished, and the Hollywood's glittering walk of fame? More like a lackluster stroll of shame without those stars. Let's flash back to a February afternoon in 1940s America when actress Hattie McDaniel rocked the house by snagging the Oscar for Best Supporting Actress in Gone with the Wind. It was a historic win, making her the first African American to bag this prestigious film award. Sounds like a party, right? Well, not really. Despite the victory, the Oscars back then operated like a whites-only gig, and McDaniel found herself segregated from the rest of the crowd. Instead of pure celebration, it was more about segregation than jubilation. Fast forward 80 years and guess what? Hollywood's still wrestling with discrimination, even though there's been some talk about boosting diversity. The 2020 Oscars? Oh, they weren't immune to racial controversies that both viewers and industry insiders have gotten pretty used to. And let's not forget the major snubs, like leaving out Lupita Nyong'o for her killer performance in the 2019 film Us. Now, let's shift gears to Tyler Perry's realm of movies and shows. No hiding the fact that black-skinned actors are often cast as the villains in his flicks. Take Steve Harris in one of Perry's classics, Diary of a Mad Black Woman. He's playing Charles McCarter, a successful lawyer who turns out to be far from the ideal hubby. Shockingly, he drops the bomb on his wife about another woman in his life and then proceeds to treat her like dirt, eventually kicking her out. And then there's Blair Underwood, known for his stint in L.A. law and rocking Hollywood for over four decades. He spilled some tea about his early career and a run-in with the legendary Sidney Poitier. Mm. There, was a little, there was a little pushback, like why, we get, why they only want to see us as slaves or in the hood and yeah. Hollywood. Or... Back in the 80s, seeing black faces on screen was like finding a needle in a haystack. And when they did pop up, the roles were pretty limited and full of stereotypes, not giving much variety for black TV viewers. Blair Underwood knows the struggle firsthand. He and Denzel Washington were like the poster guys for black male representation on TV and in movies at that time, getting props for their work. But guess what? Hollywood was still stuck in the same rut in the 90s. According to Underwood, every black actor and actress in Hollywood, no matter how known or skilled, were all hustling to audition for the same roles. Same old challenges, just a different decade. And speaking of roles, Philip Van Leer got his shot at playing a villain in Tyler's movies. He had a recurring gig in the first and second seasons of a show, rocking the part of a dealer. Ion Overman also took a turn as a not-so-nice character in Tyler's Medea Goes to Jail as Linda Davis, an envious assistant district attorney with a secret life of fraud and evidence tampering. Then there's Ron Rico Lee, who portrayed Chuck, an assistant district attorney and Joshua's friend. And who could forget Brian White, snagging a villain role in Tyler Perry's I Can Do Bad All By Myself, as Randy, the abusive boyfriend and all-around antagonist. If you've been tuning into Tyler's movies and shows, you might have noticed a trend. A lot of the not-so-nice characters tend to be really abusive towards women. It's a concerning thing that's got people raising their voices. Take his show Bruh, for example. It's all about four black dudes navigating life, dealing with relationships, friendships, and careers. They're like a tight-knit family, showing off those big smiles. Now, Sistas takes a different angle, focusing on the lives of four single black women. The tagline, single but never solo, hints at exploring their singlehood journey with all its ups and downs. But here's the kicker. The show seems to keep it more individual 
individual, with separate pics of the women instead of them together. The common thread? They're all rocking the single life, and the series might dive into their dating adventures and more. Another Tyler Perry's movie, A Fall from Grace, where Crystal Fox plays Grace Waters. She's been through the ringer with her ex-husband's affair and decides to take another shot at love with Mekod Brooks. But surprise, surprise, as she gets closer to him, she uncovers some seriously dark secrets. Grace's journey takes a twisted turn into love, betrayal, and the aftermath of people's choices. So, critics aren't letting Tyler Perry off the hook despite his contributions to the black community. They're saying, hold up, let's talk about the missteps. They point to moments in his movies and shows where black women get a rough deal or face some unpleasant stuff. Some argue that Perry's works kind of push this idea that respectability politics is the only way for his characters to find happiness and success. Plus, there's this concern that he's holding on to a ton of creative control, possibly overlooking other talented black and brown female writers and directors in the industry. Take his adaptation of For Colored Girls Who Have Considered S When the Rainbow Is Enough as an example. These critiques are basically saying, hey Tyler, we want to see more nuanced and responsible portrayals in your work. Now another rumor that has been circulating is that Tyler Perry and others might have sold their souls for success, and now they're allegedly using their power to control and oppress those who won't play along. Tyler Perry's got a massive fortune, and some folks are saying he's not using it to uplift other black creators like he could. People are talking, making wild claims about Perry causing harm instead of helping. It's pretty wild to think about, especially when we're talking about a successful guy like Tyler Perry, who could be a positive force in the industry. But hey, opinions are all over the place. Some say he's not doing enough to change the narrative. What do you think about all this? Is Tyler Perry really the bad guy some rumors are making him out to be? Or is it just a bunch of nonsense? Drop your thoughts in the comments and we'll catch you in the next video.